to connect with you again. I had such a fun time last time that in uh, in the lead up to this one, I was thinking, oh, I was so excited to just have a have a, ca a casual conversation with my friend Heather. It's so it's so nice. It's like a, a little a little um, little bit of inspiration, a little pep in my day. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's actually great. I was talking to um, a friend of mine who was um, who was listening to one of the chats that we had, and she's like, you know, it's really great. You guys are talking, and you're really talking about like real stuff. Like this guy's not promising, like making some grand promise that all will be well. She's like, he, this guy's struggling too. She's like, I believe him. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, what what does that say about what kind of content it is out there that we just maybe have nothing casual. We have nothing unscripted, like. Mm -hmm. We have nothing amongst peers or friends. Um, so, I mean, like, w w what's going on out there? Maybe that's another, another, another episode. That's a whole other episode for sure. Yeah, yeah. But you know, it also got me to thinking that um, that like nobody really comes to the path of the Dharma, or if they do, they don't stay there for very long because they're like, oh, this might be a fun thing to do, right? You know, like this this might be kind of interesting. You know, I mean, I feel like that that whole like the the first noble truth and that whole path and just really it's because it speaks so directly to what feels true to us which is our experience of our own suffering i mean but i even think that is like um you, it was, it's only when push comes to shove does someone actually come through the doorway but mo most everybody else goes by way of yoga <laughs> mm -hmm. See, yoga, yoga has a has the allure of being much more um impassioned and uh, uh, joyous and exhilarating and enticing and then and then us Buddhists uh, and especially those of us that are really doing the work it's it's not all that sexy <laughs> yeah, for, sure. For, sure. for sure yeah 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 so um and today we we're going to talk about trauma right which is I'm actually I'm very excited to talk about trauma which um, and I'm actually happy that we're going to have um, this nice long period of time in the contemplative studies program that's coming up like the next six weeks plus we have this long um, sort of like retreat module because I feel like we're, st we're still just going to barely scratch the surface of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. But my, my intention is to have a conversation starter. So like a few weeks ago, I posted uh, what was to be the genesis of our conversations, which was a, a conversation starter called let's talk trauma and and really where i was coming from was that is i just got really um honestly i just don't think we're talking about it enough i think there's so much stigma around mental health and around um shadow feelings of insecurity and inadequacy and lack of self-worth and a lot of shame unbelievable amounts of shame and then you get into the spiritual world and you're doing your meditation and somehow your meditation practice isn't working your yoga practice isn't working you don't feel any less depressed you don't feel any any less angry you have tumultuous relationships with your peers or with your um, spouses and um and then you and then you're terribly ashamed about that and you don't want to talk about that and i and i just and i in my own life in my client's life in, the, in my in with my students it's so clear that there's so much going on and yet we don't have the comfortability or the lexicon or the language or the acceptability to start talking about it publicly and openly without there being some stigma and and fear of reprisal or somehow you're not a meditator or you're not doing your work well enough. Just layer upon layer of shame and judgment that prevents us from getting to the very level where we could be actually working with what's getting in our way and what really needs to be attended to and really needs to be addressed. So I just, I got kind of concerned, actually, not just tired of the, I'm always tired of the, um, you know, the kind of marketing schemes and all the noise that's out there. You know that about me. But then with just even in-house and amongst my, my own peers, it's just like right down the line, the people that I care about most and in my own life, like these are the real things that I think need to be, um, and that a conversation needs to happen about. So that was my intention. <clears throat> I mean, one of the things I really appreciate that really got me to thinking a lot just from that little snippet that you did release a couple of weeks ago was this idea of how invisible a lot of this is to us to begin with. And just, and how, how I mean, as I start to think about it, a, a message that I feel like I've repeatedly given myself is like, oh, it's not, you haven't been traumatized. You're just so sensitive. Or, you know, like, I feel like there's all of this 
messaging that's that's in there already implanted that kind of keeps it keeps it buried you know yeah i mean unless you're walking around hobbled by a car crash or you have survived like 9 11 directly not even one degree of separation i mean you don't you're not entitled to um you know classify yourself or consider yourself uh, a recipient or or someone who is struggling with trauma and i think that that's a huge disservice to all of us because it it then precludes us from even accepting that there's something going on to even address as the buddha's first and second noble truth suggests like you have to you have to understand noble truth number one and then you have to know you know abandon the causes so i think yeah i mean i think the invisible nature of trauma is that and you know when when people are um you know, have physical trauma, we all know that people in wheelchairs and people that have been in car crashes and people that have been in burn, vi uh, burn victims and people that have been, been in tremendous assault, uh, they wear the scar, their scars are obvious. Uh, but for most of us, if we're talking about small T trauma as opposed to big T trauma, small T trauma being maybe what we would call classically or, or conventionally developmental trauma, the kind of trauma that we sustain early on in childhood where there's not the kind of presence and kind of attunement and not the kind when we're, where we get things that aren't so good for us and, we, and the things that we need elude us and our uh, primary care uh, relationships. This kind of trauma I think is, you, is ubiquitous and, and totally um, pervasive. And yet it is invisible. It's, it's right under our noses and it's not, you can be sipping tea with your friend and, and, and it's only until you hit a, a trigger that you recognize that something else is really going on in, inside of that other person. But when you hit that trigger, what happens is we cut them off or we, don't, we think they're weird or we think they're strange. You know, and, and we don't, it's, it's still just not so clear. We, we have our own reactions that have, you know, stop us from actually going deeper to see what the source is. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, and I, and I have been sort of, um, you know, un unschooling a lot of that just in my own work. And one of the things that's been really interesting is just examining just my own lineages of family and kind of the, the, um, the, inter the inter intergenerationality of trauma and how we how we inherit this you know like when i look at like the lineages i just was looking at like the lineages of women that i come from you know and that and the way that one side is very resentful and very resentful towards their children and the other side is very sort of self-deprecating and like oh it's okay i can it like the, like the other side of my, my father's side of the family they had tremendous pain that they suffered and yet they were so giving and it was always seen as like so i had these two messages that i feel like were already in there to begin with like how does how does that work? You know, how does our how does our trauma come in through that like the gateway of the impressions and the consciousness forming that we've been having from birth? I mean, as as far as I know, there are at least three gateways. You know, one one that's the most obvious is uh, the, and the most uh, you know the 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 one in our current paradigm the most acceptable is that there's a genetic or an epigenetic uh, transmission. So, so that means that. We are, in fact, inheritors of a cross or transgenerational set of DNA that um, that predisposes us to certain um, qualities, and they can get actually turned off or or or, or turned on depending on how we. Uh, they can get expressed, for example, uh, by way of our um, current experiences and and our attitudes for example and our lifestyle so there's like these these sort of like latent biological markers inside of us that we we either switch on or switch off depending on how we how we live and how we how we uh, relate that would just be one i think that's a kind of known one we wouldn't really need to go much further than that but if we wanted to add buddhism into the conversation talk about an equivalent version of that but it's uh, immaterial it's based on mind or energy and so it's in in substantial then you can't sort of observe it with contemporary measurable uh, devices for example but they would say that mind has a continuity across time and that mind uh, actions or activities produce certain kinds of effects or carry certain kinds of traces or residues, energetic residues that linger or continue. And, and so we are the inheritors of 
biological DNA and, and that can be switched on. And we are also the inheritors of predispositions, psychological predispositions. I mean, you as a mom with two kids know that even though the material matter of, of uh, 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 the, the biological matter is the same, your well, kids have very dis different predispositions, don't they? And and so we 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 have to wonder like how how is that possible? And so from a Buddhist point of view, we're we're the inheritors of 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 a kind of karmic residue from our past. And but then there would be a third one, which is a nice one, kind of as a middle way, which is the way of language. And what does that mean? It means that we are as human beings, we're story makers. Okay, so if for, for since the dawn of time, we've been sitting around fires and telling stories because we're the only species that uses language. But that language, it, it encapsulates meanings and it frames experiences, it narrates, it creates a story. And we are doing this all the time and yet we're not really accountable to our authorship. Um, and so what happens is the way that our parents framed experiences, Right, because any experience is open or vacant. It, it can be supplied different meanings. And so the meaning making that we ascribe to experiences is then transmitted orally from parent to child and from school teacher to, ch to child and from peer to peer, we are co-creating a story right now. And that story can either open us to live more optimally in a more balanced way or can, it can really constrict us and it can really terrify us and so you know narration and story making is another way that trauma is handed down I, and you know like you don't have to look further than the immediate situation in venezuela for example or or before that you look in syria and the massive displacements of human population not seen since world war ii you know what kind of so this is you can say this is a hard very very challenging uh, life-altering experience but how that experience is framed, what kind of stories adults are passing on about their experience to the children. Do they have no future? With, are they complete victims? Is life a complete misery? Or you, know, you might have other alternative stories from the same kinds of uh, genocides like the Tibetan communities and their settlements after being exiled from, from Tibet and into India. What kind of stories are they putting around their experience that actually empower offer grace, offer a compassion, help sensitize people to the human uh, predicament, help frame uh, our burdens in any particular time are actually our opportunities. I mean, that is a very, I mean, it's, it's the shift, the shift is all based on language. And that, that's, so that's another way that, um, that karma and trauma are, are trans, transmitted uh, over time. <clears throat> sure. And one of the things that I noticed is whenever, is in there just it, it almost feels like my own personal brand of maybe if we call it stuckness is like just the right stuckness to keep me stuck you know what i mean even if i can see it intellectually or if other people can be like well, why can't you just do this or even if i can say why can't i just do this i mean why is it that you that even that you can see it so clearly but it, it's, it's like so deeply ingrained in my nervous system my body is still like actually i do not believe you. Yeah, it's lodged. It's lodged in your body. Yeah. Yeah. Even if you have um, all good intentions, uh, if you don't get down to the level of working with your body and you don't address the hardwiring uh, or the protective mechanism uh, or, or, or the biology, uh, then, then it doesn't matter how well intended you are. And this, this shift is going to just be out of reach. Well, let me go back to what you were, you were bringing up, and I just want to push you a little bit, Heather, if you don't mind. So you were talking about um, reflecting on your ancestors, and, and you were saying something about the women. And, and what, what were you discovering in that sort of reflection? I just was curious if I could prod you to go a little deeper. What were you look? What were you digging? It was like some sort of archaeology was happening there, and I'm just curious what you were uh, spelunking for. I think I just was trying to figure out why it was that I had these these attitudes um, that that sort of transferred into relationships. I guess you know, in the way that I related to other people, the way that I relate to my own children, you know, and these feelings because I some of these feelings that come up are not these warm, fuzzy, loving feelings towards my children all the time. You know, I mean, sometimes I'm just like, oh, 
if it weren't for you, I would be, you know, and I, and I, and I, and I feel almost ashamed to feel what I feel. And, and so it goes large, so largely unexamined, you mm. know, like it feels like that message is just, it's just who I am. Do you mm. know what I mean? Or, or this other message that that's co-arising with it, which I recognize as coming from my fa- the women in my father's family, which is just like, oh, it is, it is very noble to suffer mm. and you should t- take all this on and, and just give. And that is, um, and that is good and, and, you know, and, and, and heroic, you know, or we're going to just bury all of this, you know, and then we're going to bury it all. And so it's a, re- it's been a really interesting thing. I've always kind of been like, oh, lineage, I don't have a very interesting family history, but I think what I'm finding is I examine my family history is that that's who I am. And, and it's all of those parts of me that I'm like, oh, oh no, really? <laughs> Well, first of all, thanks for your transparency, because I think that's exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, that's what a conversation starter really requires is people just being vulnerable enough to say like, yeah, I have these crazy thoughts sometimes about like cringes with my kids and I don't, and then, and then, and then boom, the shame comes in and says, you know, that's just you. Yeah. Don't ever say anything. Don't let anybody into that because they'll think you're crazy. So we have this terror that we're going to be rejected or ostracized for our deep dark secrets and yet our deep dark secrets are probably ubiquitous everybody has them I mean the other day I I was saying to the class that I'm on the subway platform and I have these thoughts about what would it be like to push somebody into the subway and of course like miles oh my god you and I'm and I and and I freak myself out like where did that that come from but but I ask anybody watching right now who's in control of your thoughts? I mean, you're not in control of your thoughts and some crazy thoughts come, come up. And, and from a karmic science point of view, like we are the, re- the inheritors and recipients of a long legacy of all kinds of imprints. So nothing is without boundary in your mind. You know, there's, you, you, are, you, are, you are the recipient of just about every kind of thought. So don't shock yourself. But so, I mean, in, your, in, in terms of your investigation, having... Um, understood that there is a heritage or a legacy, an ancestral totem in which you have received implicitly as a very young, impressionable a little child, the, um, the kind of rules of the game you know, what to expect and, and how to treat others and how, and what should we do with our dirty laundry and, and how should we treat each other? And you're, we are, we are given that at such an early age and it encodes. And then we wake up in adulthood feeling like this is the default. This is the status quo. This is just who I am. And so what I'm hearing from you is just the mere um, opportunity to reflect allows you enough perspective now to see like, this is not you and you have a choice. You have a choice. Whereas the day before without reflection, it was automatic. Now you have a choice to sort of self-select the rules of engagement. I mean, that's, you don't have to live by another generation's rules. You don't have to live by the people that were fragile and in denial or the people that were war torn and they, they had a scarcity mentality. I mean, if you're, if you're of the generation that was uh, a, a child born of family members that were uh, involved in a war, then you can understand their view of money and their view of resources and their view of sharing and their paranoia about other cultures. You can understand that. But then are we going to live generationally across time, the recipient of those severe impacts and limitations of thinking, or are we going to really wake up and, and, and check, like, does this really serve? And I, and it sounds to me like that's at least part of what your analysis and of course, no, there's no quick fix, right? You, what it means is waking up is just, is just the beginning of really shifting your mindset. Um, but, but that's exciting. I mean, that's exactly what I'm talking about. So thank you for sharing that, that experience. And it feels also like, I mean, these practices like refuge, I mean, which is, which is a very traditional practice, you know, taking refuge in the Buddha Dharma Sangha, just this idea of how healing refuge can be because really especially like the, the piece for me well, all of the pieces are really very healing but I feel like if you have like relational kind of trauma that having um that that relationship or those relationships 
that sort of help you rewrite that narrative are, are they really are a refuge in a lot of ways. Uh, absolutely. But, but really we always, I mean, if you want to get into specifics, mm -hmm. the refuge is both in external and internal. So right. as it relates to trauma, a lot of us have had a major breach or several major breaches in trust. And then we grow very isolated and skeptical and paranoid uh, and close hearted. And we live very independently, which keeps us safe. I call this the fortress. You know, you build or erect a fortress to keep you safe, um, but then there's no supply train coming in. Uh, so you're, you're scarce on resources because you're an island. Um, that, that is protective first. That's a defensive position in life. And many people go through their entire lives. Uh, and then our culture celebrates independence. So then you get a cultural amplification. But, <clears throat> but living that way is also n against our... Uh, mammal uh, uh, impulse. Our, 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 we are social creatures. So there's a, a contradiction at a very core level. One is to stay safe and the other is to, to bond and to attach. And so I think that leaves people, you know, protected, but really unsatisfied. And, and I say, I have actually have a feeling that that's a lot of us. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, any, any, you were shaking your head. Any thoughts on that? It's just, you know, as you're talking about this too, it's just, it's, 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 it, the whole thing really brings up, I mean, as you know, I, I was a member of the Shambhala community for a long time. Um, and there, there was a huge, you know, scandal in the Shambhala. I mean, there's been so many, and Shambhala actually has a lineage of scandal, quite truthfully, you know, so it's not surprising. But this last one really felt like a huge upheaval for me um, because I started to feel like, um, you know, like even the refuge of the Dharma, you know, that even these places where I finally felt safe to open up and explore some of these other tra traumatic things or just, or just to see myself more clearly and felt safe all of a sudden was unsafe. Yeah. And, and, and even practicing the Dharma felt, um, felt traumatized, felt re-traumatizing to practice the Dharma. Of course. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been receiving clients from Shambhala and before that, the Diamond Mountain and before that, uh, John Friend and, and you name it, we're no stranger to uh, cataclysms in our spiritual sanghas. They're, to, to me, they are um, sh also shocking and devastating. I mean, when you commit your heart to a spiritual endeavor and a teacher and a tradition, I think people give it everything. They turn everything over in a way. And I think um, so when when there's a breach in trust or a cataclysm or a fall from grace or some split or division, I think it can uh, be tremendously blindsiding and tremendously debasing at a very core level. So I can't imagine what the entire Shambhala community is going through. And I only hope that they have provisions in place for people to really process what they're going through. But my my suspicion is in the uh, early days of these um, sort of uh, events that the the top-down structural structural uh, protocol is to sort of silence everything and put out and do damage control, which I then think um, I then think that that can add further further uh, inflate and inf uh, further in, uh, in, inflame the the predicament of of people the honest people that are just you know have committed their lives to a certain practice. But it, it brings me back to the earlier point that you made about the Dharma, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, and refuge. And I, and I hear, I think it's, it's good that I clarify where I was going, the direction I was going was that there's, there's both the external Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, but there's also the internal Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. And forget, you have to have both. I mean, the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, external, are important because there, for the first time in your life, you see that it's possible that the Buddha did it. And the story is that the Buddha did it, I can do it too. And the Dharma is that, well, there's a method. It's not that just he just woke up, but there's actually a lifelong plan, a, 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 a program that we can, we can sign up for. And then the third one is, well, you don't have to do it alone. Okay, so, so suddenly you've gone from uh, someone who's suffering in isolation to someone who knows that there's a purpose for you and there's a program for you and there's fellow uh, fellow supporters of, of you but if you if you just stay there at that level and there's a breach or somebody fails or somebody falls it's no wonder that you've put all your eggs in one basket and now you feel completely just debased as if the rug was pulled out underneath you but if you could have from outset 
complemented the three outer with the three inner. Now the three inner are that um, your inner Buddha is your own Buddha nature, your own, it's, it is in a way, in, in, at first it is about you waking up and your potential, nobody else's, you can really free your mind. Um, and, and the inner Dharma is that moment where you really do start to see how reality is operating. It's not somebody else. You know, like the early psychoanalysts, they kind of psychoanalyzed their patients and they, were, they had the illumination, they had the big picture, and then they were kind of coaching people into putting the dots together. And then one moment, they, all the dots line up and a light bulb goes over your client's head. And, you know, that, that moment of illumination is, is your inner dharma. It's when you put one and one together and you go, that means two. You know, that's how it works. And then the third one is your own, your own connection, your own love, your own uh, um, appreciation for the larger whole, the larger community, your own, pl your own loving place in the larger perspective. And so all, all three of those inner ones are, are the counterbalanced or the balancing of, of putting all our faith and uh, hope in the externals because the externals come and go, they're up and down, they fluctuate. Um, and so when a teacher, when a teacher fails you, 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 if you've been following the inner one, you have your own inner resource where you can check against your own experience. You can check against your own intuitions about what's going on. But if you, at the outset, put all your eggs in the, in the, uh, I want a new mommy, I want a new daddy basket and you displace yourself put yourself into an infantile position in the hands of a caregiver who may not be any more mature than the next person. That's where we really get disenfranchised. Uh, and, and, and if you have been developing your own awareness and your own sharpening your own tool of discerning wisdom, then you always have that to fall on. And when you and I were in uh, Kathmandu with Geshe Tenzin Zopa, some of his advices left people in tears and especially the ones that had to do with people who were asking, what do I do after a tremendous crisis of heart with spiritual teachers and spiritual communities whom I had placed so much hope in? And I don't know if you had a personal encounter, but I'm sure you did. And I know I spoke to a number of other people and I was blown away by some of his answers. So I wonder if by, by way of sharing that, you could just let us know what Geshe Tenzin Zopa had to say. Yeah. I mean, I really, it was, I felt like when I was talking to him, it was almost like I was confessing, you know, and I felt like I was confessing something that I had done, you know, like I was like, like, you know, like I could, and, and I remember he just looked at me and he just said, you're, you're pure, you know, Shakti Munkuda is your root guru. And that was like something that really um, became so personal because I was able to then see, like when I would look at this statue, it wasn't a statue, it wasn't some other person. I just was like, that's me, you know? You know, and it was really, it, it made me feel okay. He's just like, we don't, we don't know why, why these things have happened to these people. We don't know why they've taken on this karma. You are pure. And I said, is it okay that I still feel inspired by some of these teachings? And he's just like, yes. He's just like, he's like yes, you are, you are pure. You know, your, your, your wisdom mind understands, you know? And it was really... It, 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 it felt it felt as true as all of that pain felt. It felt more true than all of that pain felt. Yeah, because I see him putting it back and pointing out your nature. The inner Dharma and the inner Buddha are inside of you. And so that's, I mean, that's my point. And see, it takes a great master to really give that visceral pointing out instruction. But he's like, you have to have faith and confidence in your teachers. You have to have some motivating inspiration to practice the teachings. It's always useful to... Um, you know, none of us is an island, so we always need support from our friends and peers, but all of these are impermanent, they're coming and going, and then, and there's always these internal resources that need to be developed concurrently, which is the fact is, which is your Buddha nature and your, your ability to wake up, your ability to realize things and, and your open heartedness. These are the three jewels. And I think that's what he was saying to you, he was saying, don't abandon your practice, don't abandon your path, don't abandon your good sense almost like when we're in a traumatized mode we regress into a kind of childlike mentality and part of that childlike mentality is all black and white 
okay? And all that black and white means if my guru fails or my guru did something appropriate or my sangha or my family substitute, my surrogate family fails or is divided, that I must be bad. And that's how a child thinks. I mean, that's part of a traumatic pattern. And so it's no, it's no wonder that people feel so ashamed and take on the burden of responsibility for other people's shortcomings and so want to abandon their practice because they don't want to have any association to it. And so now you've got people who've invested like you 20 and 30 years into these practices and in this path, and there's something inside of you that's driving you to say, you can't do this anymore because it's all good or all bad. And then Geshe Tenzin Zopa reminds you to, to think like a mature adult, which is to have nuance and complexities and a whole lot of gray area and to try to, to balance it out by finding a middle way, a middle ground, where maybe you understand the teacher isn't perfect, but the teachings are yours and you're, and no one should abandon their own good sense. No one should abandon their experiences. They were valid and true. And so I think this, is, this requires us to you know, sort of arrive in the present moment where we are safe so that we can recall some of that clarity and definitely that's what we felt with 35 of us at Copa, and we were safe with Bishop Tenzin Zopa. He's a respectable member and, uh, of the Sangha, and he was, I think he had captured a lot of our hearts. So a lot of our, there was a lot of wounding in that room, and I think that he was speaking right to us and putting it as, at, a, at, a, at, at, at ease by reclaiming and recalling our good sense to, to re-empower us, you know, to be our own teachers. And I remember at the end when we said goodbye to Geshe Tenzin Zopa, it was really um, one of the big um, striking memories that I have. I hope you don't mind me recollecting this publicly. I just, I just have so moved since we're talking about him, is that, uh, first of all, I felt, like, I felt like how maybe people in the 70s had, had felt when they met Lama Yeshe and Lama Zopa for the first time. I felt like that's how our group was relating to, to an exceptional being, how fortunate it was to be around for one week or 10 days with an exceptional being. But the second thought that I had immediately after that was there's no grabbing on the coattails here. Like we are, we are in retreat with this exceptional being. He's just given us a massive downloading, a transmission, a hit, talk about a historical transmission framed with a narrative designed to dislodge us from a crass, uh, trans, transgenerational trauma. That's what, that's what happened up there in Copan. But there's no holding on to the co coattails as if the medicine is inside of him. And there's no like emailing back and forth and there's no longing pining for the Geshe and there's no like, you know, there's no this glossy eyed effect of like the, the, the subordinate little boy or girl chasing their idealized fantasy of forever having mommy and daddy available at every little, um, you know, at the drop of every tear. For us, I think we, sh we had a tremendous honor and a privilege not only to come into contact with such an uh, awakened being, but then also the maturity to remember this is about us and we can work independently together. And, as, and when we came back to develop the contemplative studies program, it's not like we resurrected or recreated a hierarchy with miles on the top. That would be absurd and ridiculous but that we all agreed we're going to be mature and go through this process, this gradual process together. That was the inspiration. It's like, we all are committed. We know we want to do this work. We know it's not easy. We know it's better to do it together. Um, and, and we'd like to support each other in this, in this maturing or ripening process. And so that, and I guess she tends and Zopa's there. He knows what we're doing. I'm in touch with him every once in a while just to give him updates. But there's no, like, abandoning the inner Buddha Dharma Sangha. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, he even said to me um, when I was leaving my meeting with him, he's like, I am not your guru. And he kept saying that, you know. Well, I am not your, don't make me your guru, you yeah. know. And I just, trust someone who says that. <laughs> but don't trust somebody so much that you abandon your own inner self-worth i mean this is self-worth is also another big thing that we're going to get into in this trauma series i mean i think it's so pivotal heather what are your feelings about the idea of self-worth in a modern contemporary industrialized urban culture the idea of self-worth and the connection of being like modern do you see any connection in self-worth and 
like a modern type? Do you I mean, do you think that like maybe a, a few thousand years ago when we were more agricultural or, you know, that and, and we lived in communities that we had such poor self-esteem? Do you think that there, that's, there's any validity to something, some crazy statement like that? Yeah, no, I mean, I think I think that now, I mean, self-worth is really built very much. So, I mean, some, for some people, it's it's money, like how much do you have or how good does this look, you know, or, um, you know, how, how many, how, how, how big of a home do I have? I and mean, it could be material. Sometimes it's also like, how busy are you? What are you doing? What kind of, what kind of work are you doing? Or what does it look like? I mean, the rise of, you know, even, even a platform like this, like social media, you know, we can really present whatever we think the picture should look like. And that, that sort of actually works, I think, to damage our own self-worth as well as the self-worth of people perhaps who are seeking And so in a way, we're really, we're harming ourselves twice. So. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, I, I think that that's something I'd like to explore further when we get into class because I have this crazy, I've been road testing this crazy hypothesis that doesn't seem to have as yet been um, sanctified by the powers that be, all the researchers. But I have this crazy idea um, then we should wrap it up soon because I could get carried away with my me my musings. Uh, forgive me, <clears throat> but there's there's something about post-industrial modern society where we've become so fragmented and and we no longer even have the benefit of having even a nuclear family of two parents anymore because work has become the new child where that has sucked the attention of the parents. So we're really <clears throat> as very as from infancy to childhood we're like sort of cast towards school or we get you know a, a hodgepodge makeshift of, of caregivers there's no real um you know it's hard to maintain enough presence that used to be a long time ago spread out in the extended family grandparents and cousins and aunties and all, and everybody living in in a kind of community uh, space, um, you know, farming together and, and maybe having six hours a day of work and then the other, you know, sharing stories around the fire or whatever, like this is, maybe that's a little romantic, but I also want to, I also sort of feel like our attention has become so scattered. And I, I just wonder if our attachment relationships, the, the attunement presence and consistency and reliability from early childhood has, has been impacted so severely that we're creating a culture of insecurely attached people that are completely fragmented and dysregulated and tend towards narcissism, tend towards aggression and rage, et cetera, et cetera, that a whole slew of our contemporary pathologies and, and, and mental illnesses and, and, and psychological issues and conditions can be traced to being an urban, um, industrial, uh, fragmented, and materialistic. The paradigm of materialism does, does a whole amplification of this, where we have no religion anymore. We have no stories. We have no uh, spiritual rituals. We have no community bonds. We're basically, Amazon is the god or the deity or the new church with its drones dropping down packages on mass on our heads. Like this is, this is where, we, and, and no wonder we're so sick. And so and what's the biggest sickness? Like our um, sense of being unworthy. I mean, right down the line, I think in our class, the contemplative studies program, when we started doing our self analysis, I think right down the line, everybody can relate to feeling insignificant. And I think, I personally think that that is a malady uh, of our modern urban time. I don't know if, I mean, the, when the Dalai Lama was first in conversation with early scientists, he didn't have a word for low self-esteem. Uh, so we, I mean, when we, when we get into the first workshop on the 29th, it's ritual. It's about ritual. And, the, and then the, and then the series of lectures is on, on trauma. And then people are going like, how are you putting those two things together? Okay. Well, this is, this is how I'm putting those two things together because I think as a culture, we, we've thrown the baby of spirituality out with the bathwater of religion. And, and as a result, we have deep, deep uh, wounding and emotional wounds. So we have to bring back some sort of spiritual worldview and some of these rituals to get us that, that like that atrophied part of our psyche exercised again and to get penetrative enough to do the, 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 the trauma work that we're going to set on doing, but I don't want to take any more of our time. Do uh, you have any closing, do you have any closing thoughts? I think we need to have a, a follow-up conversation at some point about, my, about my <laughs> mindfulness, right? That's, Leave a comment if you want more. We got to have a big mindfulness conversation. We got to have that conversation. That's like the classic sort of what? Yes, yes, more, more. <laughs> Thank you, 
you so much. I, yeah, I, I, I don't want to stop, but I also know that everybody's attention span only, you can only handle 30 minutes at a time. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, I, hope, I hope people out there know that the, uh, the Contemplative Studies program is accepting new membership for a small window, small time. There's a small little window open that you can join us for the next week or two and even receive a 20% discount uh, to, to sort of... Uh, 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 invite you into the process of our uh, extensive journey for the remainder of the year and that that window will close and will not be open until next year when we start year two and so Jan, uh, uh, June 29th we begin uh, the module two uh, trauma-informed dharma uh, including a workshop on ritual and then six lectures on trauma so I look forward to seeing you and working with you in that. Heather, thank you so much for all your inspiration and all your commitment, all you do for your, your own family, but also all the kids that you work with. And um, I look forward to seeing other people that have been really um, chatting it up on the Facebook. Uh, thank you so much for your interest and we hope to see you soon. Take good care. Bye-bye.